All right. Welcome back. Welcome back to this week's session of the Aurora Lecture Series on Diversity in Higher Education. As always, we'll start with a quick summary of last week's lecture when Sabine Engel from Innsbruck introduced us to some legal aspects of doing diversity in the academic context. Very fundamentally, however, she started off with the question how the law protects us from discrimination with regard to age, ethnic background, gender, religion, sexual orientation and disability and health impairments. This list is the result from many a debates in court and politics and represents the principles of protecting security, order, democracy in Western societies in the 21st century. It is thus, and we've talked about this uh, in, in other lectures as well, it's a historically and culturally specific meaning the list can change depending on when and where you live. And for us, this is an interesting aspect because in current debates, there seem to be values which are worth protecting regardless of the context, like liberty, uh, human rights, well-being of children, etc. But of course, we know that these have been fought for and they're not self-evident. So are they're historic in uh, their genesis. And many of these fights took place within the frame of the law or in court. Sabine Engel presented legal frameworks like the EU legislation, national constitutions, federal law and university acts, and the last addendum, the women's promotion plan. Some of these contradict each other and the implementation is not always as straightforward as we like to believe. And I think it was very interesting for us to listen to Sabine Engel on this topic because um, we usually sit together with her in hiring committees where these different laws needs to be implemented and these debates are really highly interesting. And in this context, we discuss then questions of affirmative action and difficulties that arise from clashes of laws on the EU and national level. And today we return to the European angle of this course with our speakers from Olmutz University and their lecture on British and American perspectives on diversity. And Dirk will introduce the two of them to you now. Yes, welcome also from my side. It's a pleasure to have you all back for our Brown Bag Lecture Series. So we are close to finish here in the last uh, meetings. Um, uh, and um, and now we are moving to uh, Padatsky University in Olmütz with a with a couple, a professional couple and a private couple. Um, it's a pleasure to have you both here um, in our lecture series. Um, it's uh, Pavlina Fleischerova and Jerzy Fleischer. Um, and I think uh, Pavlina will start. So I start with Pavlina introducing her. Um, Pavlina Fleischerova um, is an associate professor at the Department of English and American Studies at uh, Palatsky University in Olmütz. Um, she was in 1999 2000 a Fulbright visiting uh, scholar at the Catholic University in uh, Washington uh, DC in the US and she published uh, numerous uh, scholarly monographs. Uh, um, mostly on uh, uh, on the poetry, um, the bridge and the eclipse metaphor in the poetry of Samuel Taylor Coleridge, for example, 2004, or uh, poetry in Great Britain and Northern Ireland after 1945 in 2007, and there would be more books to mention. Um, um, she also contributed several entries to the Greenwood Encyclopedia of American Poets and uh, Poetry and co-authored three monographs on Scottish contemporary fiction and a volume of uh, Canadian literary uh, history, all published with Palatsky University Press. Um, besides uh, being a scholar of uh, English and American studies, she's also the vice dean uh, for international uh, relations at um, Palatsky um, University and therefore also an important part of our Aurora uh, network. So welcome uh, Pavlina and uh, uh, and the second part is uh, Jerzy Fleischer. He is uh, uh, an assistant professor of English at Palatsky University and teaches American and British history, American literature and creative uh, writing. He authored also 
um, few uh, monographs on American literature and culture, most recently the culture of American suburbs with Palatsky University um, Press. Uh, and uh, his main research topics are issues of identity, race and ethnicity in American suburban literature and film. So you see where that leads us to. Um, so we are very close to our uh, topic, but coming from a, I think this time a little bit from a different angle, from the angle of literature. Um, so uh, thanks for joining us. Thanks for taking your time. And uh, so with that, I hand it over to you, Pavlina. Uh -huh. uh, you have the first part of the presentation. And so we decided to have both presentations together and then a discussion afterwards together. Okay, uh, good uh, morning everyone and thank you for having both of us uh, and giving us the opportunity to speak uh, to uh, the viewers across the Aurora network. We are very proud to be part of that. Um, uh, at the same time, it's very nice uh, and it ties with uh, last week's uh, presentation on the legal framework because the legal framework uh, to a great uh, extent influences the diversity, identity and success in higher education all the more uh, in uh, Britain and um, my colleague will speak about the American um, perspective uh, subsequently. Just to give you a little bit of introduction, uh, typically they distinguish the following uh, types of universities within the British context. They talk about the Asian universities and when you think about those, uh, usually what we refer to are uh, Oxford and Cambridge University, but also the universities of St Andrews, University of Glasgow and the University of Aberdeen and last but not least Edinburgh University and to go uh, to the other part of the United Kingdom, the University of Dublin. As you can see from this, uh, this list, uh, there are the two ancient universities of, of, uh, universities of Oxford and Cambridge uh, together with the Scottish universities. There are four of them. So the stronghold of education rested in uh, Scotland for many, many years and decades. Then, uh, because uh, the community was very tight and the access to the ancient universities was limited, uh, limited in terms of gender, in terms of religion, because only Catholics could be admitted uh, uh, to Oxford and Cambridge. Uh, at the beginning uh, of the 20th century, there was an utter need to establish uh, a competition uh, to those and to give more opportunities to British citizens seeking tertiary education. So the so-called Red Brick universities were uh, established. And when you look at the list, uh, namely the University of Liverpool, for example, Manchester, Sheffield or Reading, they responded to the local needs and to the needs of the local uh, industry. Unlike the Asian universities, they were very different in character. So, uh, no tutorial system, but rather the system that we know today, uh, meaning, you know, the system of seminars and lectures, and uh, they were not resident universities. Uh, students and staff commuted from um, the region, whereas when you went to the Asian University, you left in the dormitory. So the climate uh, was very, very different, and those uh, paved the way to opening um, uh, opening the access to the university to a wider public. Of course, after uh, the Second World War, uh, there were more uh, people willing to study uh, at universities. So the plate glass universities have been sometimes uh, labelled as new universities as well. Uh, they were very similar in character to the red brick. Um, uh, the, the labels derive from the architectural styles. And last but not least, we had polytechnics. 
these were higher institutions uh, that were aiming at uh, business, at uh, fields of study that were very, very technical. And in the 1990s, they got uh, the status of universities. Uh, in this context, I would like to mention the open university that responded to uh, the needs of British society. Why so? Uh, because after the Second World War, uh, many people found it difficult to go uh, back to the university full time because they needed to support uh, their families and they needed to uh, support the national economy. And that is why this distance learning uh, was opened. And um, Open University was progressive in terms of the criteria of admission. They disregarded race, they disregarded uh, uh, ethnicity, they disregarded gender, they disregarded religion. So anyone who had the uh, qualification to apply could apply. What students value uh, today and what we miss, uh, for example, in my country, is the admission system. That they have a unitary enrollment and admissions in, in terms that you apply and you give preference to the universities. And if you are not um, admitted by the first university of your choice, your application is automatically redirected to the second choice and so on and so on. So um, the uh, British Ministry of Education tries to find a place suitable for the candidate as much as they can. Uh, all right. However, if I focus on uh, the 20th century, until the 1950s, uh, if you look at the profile of British universities, and both in terms of uh, staff and student representation, that was predominantly uh, white. You could hardly meet anyone who would not be of Anglo-Saxon or Protestant um, background. And that went hand in hand with the political representation, because in this slide you can see Winston Churchill's uh, quote um, that um, he uh, used uh, during his speech uh, in the Houses of Parliament, where he said, keep England white was a good slogan. However, he added, I think, uh, to keep Britain white as the most important subject facing this country, but I cannot get any of my ministers to take any notice. What he meant by that, he, uh, his mind rested on this prejudice and stereotype. He did not want to open the institution and the British society towards immigrants and towards the newcomers from uh, the former British colonies. And I will uh, sort of focus on that uh, throughout the rest of my presentation. Why so? Um, uh, to use the example of the British Caribbean, uh, after uh, the Second World War, of course, many of the former British colonies tried to gain uh, their independence, uh, India being the first uh, among them. In uh, the Caribbean, uh, the British government advertised uh, for open jobs uh, and open opportunities and open educational opportunities. They needed uh, forces to fill uh, the, the spots there were, that uh, were uh, blank after the Second World War because many people died in the war and that is why uh, they had a strategy to involve people from the former colonies because one, they uh, could speak English, second, they were very well uh, familiar with the British administrative system and third, uh, which is the most important aspect for us uh, today, uh, they were educated in line with the British educational system. So
so uh, the government thought they would fit in very easily and uh, they possessed British passports. So legally speaking, they were British citizens. So British government was willing to, to pay for their voyage and for their assimilation process in Britain. Of course, knowing that sooner or later, uh, they or their children would um, enter the British educational system. The situation, however, was not very easy because uh, British society did not want to accept the immigrants. They felt endangered and that caused clashes in the educational system. Uh, when you look at the census data, uh, at the end of the 19th century, approximately there were only 9,000 uh, people with Caribbean roots. And when you compare it to the massive uh, number of 2011, you can understand why uh, the people were afraid. And when you compare it to 1961 uh, as well, you know, within a decade between 1951 and 61, there was a huge increase in the number of Caribbean uh, immigrants. I'm using the word immigrants, but uh, in fact, they were British uh, citizens coming home and the mother country showing its back uh, on them because when they arrived, no accommodation was ready, no jobs offered, and they literally, some of them survived on the platforms of uh, the train stations. And they were um, public uh, upheavals uh, and uh, protests that they should return home, but they could not, of course. And the educational system had to accommodate them. When you look at the ethnic structure of the UK population, that is very important in view of today's situation at uh, the British uh, universities. So, um, of course, the white uh, population is still uh, predominant, but of course we have the uh, huge group of Asian um, people with Asian background and people with African uh, or black background. Unlike in the US, it is politically correct to say uh, black British people because they are very proud of that. Uh, saying that it, gi it gives them the uh, identity and they want to be identified uh, like that. Uh, I have included uh, this slide in order to show uh, the geographical distribution because um, it is in line and goes hand in hand with the distribution of the ethnic students at British universities. Uh, the uh, regions that are highlighted in red are the metropolitan regions and uh, ethnic groups, um, using the example of the Asian um, group and of the black um, students, they have or they carry with them uh, certain cultural uh, habits and they like to stay at home while they study. So unlike uh, the white uh, British, they don't mind going to uh, and applying to a university that will, would be outside their hometown or their home um, uh, village. Whereas uh, the people from uh, the ethnic minorities, they like to stay within their community. And that is why they mostly apply to the big new universities. That is not the ancient universities that I talked about but to those that are at hand or where they feel uh, safe because they would not be uh, alone uh, there. Uh, what I found interesting is the entry rate. Uh, that is the percentage of people of various ethnic background applying uh, to the university. And when you look at the graphics, um, you can read it 
but what it shows very um, very nicely is that uh, among uh, those who are very motivated and that is because of the uh, cultural habits and the appreciation of quality education uh, are the Chinese. They are very motivated and once they are accepted, they hardly ever drop out of the universities. Uh, from my own experience, when you come to the university library in the morning, uh, the first people you meet uh, are the Chinese and the last people to leave when the library closes are again the Chinese. Uh, in comparison, the white pupils have the lowest uh, entry uh, rate. The post-war uh, period uh, saw a great transformation in terms of diversity and identity structure of uh, the students and staff alike. So until the mid-1980s, the universities were considered uh, to be very elitist, but the government, through a series of uh, white papers, introduced the tertiary um, a system as being open to a mass uh, admission. So the student numbers tripled between 1980 and 2010. However, when I speak about opening the doors and gates of the universities, uh, I do not mean uh, the Asian universities. When you look at the two uh, last bullets uh, on this slide, you can see um, that there were many obstacles uh, applicants and students had to overcome. For example, women were not allowed um, to Oxford and Cambridge until 1870s. And even if they were allowed and completed all the courses and sometimes performed much, much better than their male colleagues, they could not uh, receive a degree at Oxford until 1920 and be at Cambridge until 1948. Co-education, forget about that at Asian universities until the 1980s when many of the colleges retained uh, uh, separate education for women and for, uh, for men, unlike the red brick or plate glass or polytechnics. Um, it's interesting to compare it to the student mobility in the past, uh, because during the uh, Middle Ages, uh, one in ten students uh, came from other countries. In the 19th and 20th century, uh, due to the dominance of the so-called nation state, uh, traveling of students abroad to gain experience uh, was limited due to financial means and uh, due to the restrictions that were imposed by the state. Uh, the situation is totally uh, uh, different in the 20th and 21st century when many of the students seek uh, some foreign or international experience. And as you can see, the OECD uh, statistics uh, shows that over 2.7 million of students were enrolled outside their country of citizenship. And uh, when I talked about the geographical distribution of various um, ethnic, uh, ethnic groups across uh, Britain, uh, that corresponds uh, to the international climate at the UK universities. And uh, that's one of the factors um, that is decisive as a criterion uh, for uh, the decision which university the student or uh, academic um, would apply to. So uh, the universities highlighted in uh, um, uh, blue are the metropolitan ones uh, based in London and only two um, in the most international uh, internationalized uh, universities that is Manchester and Middlesex University are outside the uh, the capital. Uh, 
UK, um, that was the case before Brexit, of course, uh, when uh, British universities were part of the uh, EU, and that is why the tuition fees were for EU applicants the same as for the domestic students, uh, was the second most popular destination in the world. Uh, after Brexit, we don't have the uh, statistic data uh, that would be relevant yet, but it's estimated that it will drop significantly because uh, the tuition fees for overseas students, they escalate. Um, I also looked at uh, the countries that uh, send most students to UK universities, and that would be China, India, uh, American, um, uh, United States, Hong Kong, and Malaysia. Uh, within the EU, it's Italy, France, and Germany. Um, okay, uh, what are the most uh, popular areas of studies that both the domestic and international students creating the diversity at uh, the campuses uh, look for? That would be business and administration, engineering, social studies, creative arts, and biological uh, sciences. Why so? Uh, I will get to that um, in a minute. Why? Uh, when you look at the right hand side uh, of uh, this slide, uh, there are several criteria that influence the choice. Uh, that is the entry standards. Uh, some students seek quality, some students seek uh, easy access. And although there are no quotas, um, at least not official quotas, for uh, the distribution uh, among the various applicant groups uh, in terms of how many would be accepted from which group, uh, it shows uh, that um, uh, the students with uh, uh, ethnic uh, uh, background or uh, that are not Protestants, they're afraid to go to the very conventional and traditional institutions. So they'd rather apply to the newer uh, universities. Uh, Student satisfaction, if there is any uh, staff that supports them. For some of them, the research quality of the institution is of interest. And uh, when I talked about the subjects um, or areas of study they seek, the graduate prospects, uh, what is the ratio of employed and unemployed uh, graduates from that university and from that field? The left-hand side shows uh, the top-ranking uh, universities in the British uh, context. And I would like to draw your attention to the University of Warwick, which is rather traditional, but at the same time progressive, in terms of accommodating various needs of students and staff alike. Uh, among the conditions for uh, success, uh, I would like to mention the support already at primary and secondary level of education. Why so? Uh, because if you don't have the role mo models, uh, it's hot to uh, succeed and how to uh, pursue your studies on the secondary and tertiary uh, level. Uh, second, offer of various university study programs that would reflect the diversity. And I took these quotes from a Pearson research that look at diversity, identity and success in British education. And it says, for example, the first one, not seeing yourself reflected in what you learn can have an impact on aspirations and outcomes. Many of our children don't have parents that work in skilled work, that have studied to a high level or achieved success in arts, for example. So it's essential children see role models being successful in all areas of the curriculum. In other words, uh, if they don't have support at home, the system should provide uh, for them. 
and uh, within the second quote, um, uh, the students found it very, uh, very important to be able to relate uh, to their own uh, experiences and to connect to the new, uh, to connect the new material to uh, familiar concepts. Uh, third, uh, feeling well, that is fitting in into the climate of the university. They need a support in the administrative staff and student associations. And um, I should also mention the language of instruction. Of course, English is the pro uh, prevalent uh, language of instruction and most of the students who apply speak uh, English uh, as their mother tongue. But on the other hand, uh, the bar students uh, for whom uh, English is, and they use this label uh, in the new millennium, not as a second language, but they uh, always repeat this additional language. So the language barrier has to be overcome. The universities are not a closed system, so they have to respond to uh, public initiatives, such as the Black Lives Matter uh, protests, and they should reflect that. Because the Pearson research that I used in the previous slide showed that uh, although there are some significant changes in the student admissions, the teaching and administrative staff remains predominantly white and Anglo-Saxon. And uh, uh, number six here on the slide, there are no appropriate textbooks reflecting diversity. It's very much uh, still white British oriented. And uh, so this is the administration and uh, carrier services that should go hand in hand with the new progress. Uh, when I talked about uh, the curriculum and the textbooks, uh, diversity is left out of them. Uh, on the example of history uh, curriculum, uh, teachers being asked about the diversity, whether it's including uh, in one way or another, uh, they had to give the response that many of the pioneering historical figures that are not white were not included because what was taught were the big histories of the nations, that is the success of the British Empire, and the history of the colony, uh, of the colonies um, um, were left out. So uh, currently uh, there is an attempt to decolonize the curriculum and to include uh, pioneering figures such as Mary C. Cole or uh, Aquiano. And um, to give you uh, examples of those who made it and uh, who uh, contributed towards the change in attitude in higher ex uh, education in Britain, let me mention Professor Stuart Hall, who um, you know was the founding um, member of the Birmingham School of uh, cultural studies that did a lot for uh, racial equality in Britain, or a public figure, Sir Trevor MacDonald, who was the first black British uh, BBC presenter. And uh, from the history, uh, John Edmonston, who taught Charles Darwin, and without, uh, without whom Charles Darwin probably wouldn't have come uh, uh, up with the theory that we all know uh, about today. Uh, the other example, and I'm approaching the end of my presentation, is diversity in literature. Uh, on the secondary level, no writers with ethnic background were included in the curricula. And British publishing houses, the major ones, were not willing to publish works uh, that would reach the general public and that would give the perspective of British citizens because uh, by now we have second and third um, a generation of immigrants in, in Britain 
And only uh, around the millennium, people like Grace Nichols or Monica Ali or Andrea Levy or last but not least Bernadine Evaristo made it. And uh, quite strikingly, the first conference uh, on Black British Studies did not take place in Britain at the British Institute uh, University, but it took place uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, in USA in 2000. And uh, the University of Warwick uh, runs a centre for Caribbean studies and two other universities joined the effort, uh, effort to offer study programs that would diversify the very uh, white-oriented uh, uh, context and uh, they offer black lit literature. And uh, I will share the presentation with all those uh, that are interested afterwards. But these are uh, the writers that pave uh, the ground for uh, today's opening of, uh, of the curriculum for uh, interest of all potential uh, students. And let me end uh, by this slide showing uh, Bernadine uh, Evaristo, the recent winner of uh, the major um, British book prize with this book, A Girl, Woman, Other. Uh, mixing 12 different British characters and she was a, uh, the first uh, black woman writer winning uh, the prize uh, jointly with Margaret uh, Atwood and when BBC announced uh, the award uh, we were left speechless in the audience uh, because they left out Bernadine's name. So I think I will end my speech by saying uh, British uh, uh, tertiary uh, educational authorities still have to learn and have a long way to go uh, to uh, practice uh, diversity uh, and success um, uh, at home. Thank you. And I will give the floor to my colleague. Hello, good afternoon everyone. Okay, let me see if I am able to uh, fast forward my slides. Yes, I am. So I will, can you hear me please? Okay, so I will focus on a history of diversity in American higher education over the centuries. I will throw in brief mentions of many different aspects, finally hoping to arrive at the one topic which I found the most hotly debated topic in US higher education since the 1960s or 70s, and that is the topic of affirmative action. So I will get to that, but before I do, a few slides to introduce a short and sketchy history of American US uh, uh, higher education. So here you see the earliest colleges and universities, Harvard being the oldest, College William and Mary, Yale, U of Pennsylvania, and so on, uh, following. Um, now, uh, the colonial times, higher education in the colonies had to fight for really recognition when, for example, a delegation from the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, went to England and asked for a royal approval to set up the College of William and Mary. They were responded to by a government official when asking to give, be given a grant to set up an uh, institution to save or cultivate cultivate the colonist souls, souls, damn your souls, plant tobacco. So that was one of the challenges that colonial British government uh, responded to, like to, to early American attempts at setting up higher education. Uh, okay, uh, I will fast forward, uh, but Early centuries, from the 17th up to the 19th, in U.S. higher education, 
the curriculum developed. There wasn't any diversity in terms of faculty or, or students. They were pretty much all white and male, but there was a growing diversity in the area of uh, the school curriculum. So early colleges and universities, of course, catered to the need to produce clergymen and ministers and priests. Subsequently, there were also degrees in law and medicine, but it only happened in the 18th and 19th centuries that a more broad curriculum uh, was introduced at many higher education institutions throughout the, the country. Uh, some of these included the University of Virginia set up by founding father and US, early US President Thomas Jefferson, who was a great champion of a broad practical curriculum. Or later, Harvard U was modernized in the final decades, notably of the 19th century, by a longtime uh, president, Charles W. Eliot, who was inspired by a visit uh, to European universities early on to really advocate a great turn towards a more practical curriculum, not only at Harvard, but at all American universities and colleges. So he, uh, in an essay called The New Curriculum in 1869, he predicted that the new curricula at US schools uh, of higher education should uh, uh, abandon the limits of just studying the classics, Greek, Latin, and so on, and embrace living European languages and newly, newly developing social sciences, and so on and so forth. Uh, I will fast forward to diversity in the area of student body as well as faculty, uh, which is really where the most development has been happening in the US since the 19th century. Uh, so the first step towards diversity was the inclusion of women as students. As you know, until the 19th century, women in the US could not study at colleges or universities. So there were two broad uh, reactions and policies which catered to the rising class of US women who wanted to get advanced education in the 19th century. One, some schools uh, would gradually open doors to women students, but just a handful of pioneer schools did that. And two, the other option was setting up a system, uh, I mean, setting up women's only colleges and universities, single sex institutions of higher education, where the new class of women students could study and the sanctity in quotation marks of all male traditional institutions would not thus be broken. Let me show you some examples. So Oberlin College is the leader in uh, U.S. higher education because in the 1830s, immediately after it was founded, it started admitting women students as a general policy and it started admitting African-American students because there was a lot of abolitionist thinking in uh, the state of Ohio at the time. By contrast uh, to pioneering open universities to women or blacks as Oberlin College, famous universities such as the Ivy League ones were very reluctant and slow to open doors to women students, meaning to go co-educational. As you see, some of the big eight famous private institutions uh, waited until the late 20th century to really allow women students. Columbia, 1981. Harvard, 1977, and so on and so forth. Um, now, I have a brief argument for co-education. So real life, they argue, is co-ed and separating male and female students is not a practical idea. Uh, now, my next slide focuses on the 
ways in which the 19th century rise of new higher educational institutions catered to the women's uh, needs. And that was the rise of women's, single sex women's only colleges and universities. The proto college was called Salem, but it's widely not recognized as the first because for many years, it only had the status of some sort of primary or secondary school. So the very earliest women's only college is Wesleyan, founded in the 1830s. And they say it's been the oldest uh, women's only institution in the world, which would grant even uh, college degrees to, to women students. Again, I mention a very interesting group of private liberal arts colleges, very famous ones, uh, called the Seven Sisters, which were founded again to, to provide in the 19th century excellent education in the liberal arts to, to women students, again at a time when traditional schools still didn't open their gates to, to women students. Uh, Ironically, some of these Seven Sisters schools have still been women's only, you know, in some ways defying the recent 20th century legislation against discrimination on the basis of color and so on. But they have been private, so they, they have more liberty to oppose going co-educational. Okay. These are some of the arguments in favor of choosing a single sex institution, but anyway. Now, my next slide shows a couple of firsts in the higher education of women in the States. So in 1840, a first woman earns a college degree from Wesleyan, an early pioneer of higher education for women. Uh, and you see, through the 19th century, uh, American women students got ahead in many more institutions, getting degrees and getting accepted, and so on and so forth. Um, nowadays, the, the general figure of women students at all higher educational institutions is pretty much about 60%. So in recent years, women have, of course, been a majority of, of students at US colleges and universities with very interesting and important uh, effects. Now, the next diversity development I focus on is the business of race. Yeah, until the 19th century, American institutions were white and male only. Uh, but there were some early pioneers. For example, around 1800, a black free man called John Davis supposedly became the first ever black uh, student to get an uh, education at ironically a very southern conservative school called the Washington and Lee University. He later became a preacher. Another pioneer, but these were, you know, exceptions of one time black students somehow being able to squeeze in to get education at white only institutions is Mr. Twilight, who became the first known African-American to graduate from a college. Uh, actually, an abolitionist state and college called Middlebury in, in, in Vermont. Now, uh, as I've said, systematic inclusion of African-Americans as students only happened in the, from the 1830s and again at Oberlin College, Ohio, which uh, admitted women as well as African-American students in the 1830s as the first school anywhere. There were some token acceptances which did not last. For example, Harvard in 1850 briefly accepted three black students, but after their white counter peers became furious, they again threw them out. So they never finished a degree, which only happened when Mr. Greener became the first African-American to graduate from Harvard 20 years later. But still, Harvard did not have a, you know, a general policy of accepting um, women or minorities at the time. So what happened? Through the 19th century, 
another parallel development which would cater to the rising need of African Americans to get advanced education was the setting up of many what they call historically black colleges and universities which would be African American only students and they, it was there that they would be able to get advanced education. Some of these, now the list is a messy one, I know about that, but many of these started off, you know, as some sort of secondary schools and only were elevated to, to university or college status many years later. But Cheney University is credited to be the first uh, historically black uh, university and many others soon followed, Howard or others you have known. Now, this aggregation of higher education did not happen overnight and it didn't happen, contrary to what many people think, as a result of these, this 1954 famous US Supreme Court decision on desegregating uh, public schools called Brown versus Board of Education. Already before this decision, when an individual sued a US university in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, uh, citing discrimination, uh, in many cases, the court would already order before Brown in individual cases for a school to open to a non-white student, things like that. But nothing systematic. Uh, so it was only following Brown versus Board of Education that in the 50s and especially 1960s, many higher educational institutions, colleges and universities were tested by civil rights activists who tried to enroll as non-white students and things uh, got ahead. Now, I will uh, fast forward because I have many more slides and the affirmative action uh, is really my focus. So the term was coined by a lawyer on the team of Mr. Vice President Nixon, who worked for President Kennedy. And of course, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was a crucial act of legislation out set out first uh, to address the situation, discrimination in the workplace, later applied to, to discrimination even in academia inter, in the area of student enrollments and uh, faculty hirings, uh, academics jobs. Uh, what's important, by uh, late 1960s, many famous American universities and colleges voluntarily adopted civil rights uh, affirmative action policies in hirings of students as well as faculty. Um, now, uh, I will mention some cases or ever since the 1970s, some people, some students most notably uh, sued uh, American universities citing reverse discrimination. Uh, I will skip over this one, but, uh, okay, a recent, a recent uh, take uh, by Louis Menand on the history of uh, affirmative action in, in uh, U.S. higher education since the 1960s is that outlawing racial discrimination has made it harder to remediate its effects. Once we passed laws to protect people of color from being treated differently in ways that were harmful to them, uh, there is the trouble of treating uh, people of color differently in ways that might be beneficial. Uh, we took race out of the equation to realize that if we truly wanted not just equality of opportunity for all Americans, but equality of result, we needed to put it back in. This paradox has been called affirmative action. Now, I, I will mention a major uh, court case which made it all the way to the Supreme Court in late 70s called the Baki versus Regents of the University of California in which a white uh, medical school uh, applicant was rejected and closely, it was a close call, but there was a quota set up for minority students 
who were accepted in place of uh, lower ranking white applicants such as Mr. Baki, regardless of their results. So it was a major decision by the Supreme Court, which on one hand uh, ordered the University of California to accept Mr. Baki as student, but on the other hand also allowed it and other universities to keep up some sort of consideration of race in, in college enrollments even afterwards. They only were told to never again call it a racial quota. The quota term became a no-no after the Baki case decision. Uh, so there have been arguments for as well as against affirmative action by academics, by critics, by scholars, uh, civil rights activists since the 1970s. Uh, there were other notable court cases such as Grutter versus Bollinger in 2003, uh, in which again it was reaffirmed that affirmative action policies are okay in accordance with the Constitution. Uh, what has ha been happening has been a very interesting thing. In some uh, states of the US, affirmative action has been again banned, most notably in the state of California, where it happened in 1996, and uh, more recently in the state of Michigan, where it was banned in, in 19, uh, 2006. Now, what happened in California? You know, advocates of uh, affirmative action cried at the time that minorities would disappear from uh, California schools. No, it hadn't happened like that. But what has happened in California after the ban is a major rise in numbers of Asian American students uh, became the norm and some sort of drop uh, of enrollments in the African American community uh, was a result. Now, in affirmative action policies, basically three major minorities have been widely discussed uh, as opposed or in connection with the white majority everywhere. One, the African Americans, two, the Latinos or Hispanics, and three, the Asian Americans. Uh, so, let me fast forward to, to some, some uh, of, of my graphs or tables, because I have many more tables and I'm, I'm running out of time. But anyway, so um, this is a table which focuses on the rise of women students overall at US schools since the 1970s until the 70s, male students were the majority, uh, the opposite, uh, sizable a majority of women students have been the norm for the past several decades. Uh, this is interesting uh, because it, as you know, of the four, uh, of the three major minorities, Asian Americans, African Americans and Hispanics, the most successful academically minority has for decades been the Asian Americans. Yeah, this table shows you that the level of achieving at least a college degree, bachelor's or higher, is way higher than is the case for whites or for any other uh, minority. Now, uh, the way this traditional uh, situation of the Asian Americans being overachievers in terms of uh, ed advanced education has been has been uh, has been uh, reflected in the different levels of requirements at many prestigious schools and universities based on race. So, for example, the SAT infamously has been uh, treated very differently based on the racial origin of a student applicant for many years at even the famous schools. For example, uh, this table shows 
that a white student who scores on SAT something like slightly over 1300, which is average, but not good enough for the Ivy League, uh, is treated on the level with an African-American who scores just 1000, over 300 points less. And if you, for example, on the other hand, were Asian-American to be treated evenly by the entrance committees, you would have to score over 1400. Yeah, and somewhere in between the African Americans and whites is where the requirements for Hispanics would stand. I'm not seeing it, but yeah, Hispanics, uh, they had again something like 130 bonus over white applicants to the minus. Uh, so, um, there have been lawsuits such as in the most recently in the uh, 2010s, representing Asian American student applicants at famous universities who argued racial discrimination because for obvious reasons, even if, uh, I'll show you a few more slides just to prove the case, uh, even if Asian Americans have been super successful even at the famous universities, despite the relative discrimination of them at the entrance process, they still feel uh, having to score higher on SAT and having to be more brilliant than anybody else makes them discriminated against. Even if, as you see, of all the minorities accepted, for example, at Harvard 20 years ago, the Asians have been the most successful of the groups. Uh, so, um, this is the most recent Harvard demographic uh, distribution. Sorry, it's very small print and I have problems uh, deciphering it. But um, the percentage of minority students accepted uh, to Harvard last year uh, says about 16% of these, of the total accepted students have, were African-American last year, about 26% were Asian-American, uh, about 13% were Hispanics, and the large figure, which is something like 50 plus percent, have been white. Yeah, so, so, uh, despite many claims that uh, famous U.S. and private universities such as the Ivy League ones have become uh, dominant, predominantly ethnic, the opposite has been true. They have still been uh, predominantly white uh, and the minorities have had uh, rising numbers in terms of student body, but not so much as, as was thought of. Uh, now, there has been one other kind of weird effect of affirmative action. Uh, Daniel Golden, in a book called The Price of Admission, several years ago, uncovered a scandalous policy which famous US universities never like to talk about of privileging rich white uh, students at uh, enrollment stage over equally or much more qualified other students. So for example, while minorities make up 10 to 15% of a typical student body at a famous and expensive private American institutions, uh, affluent white students dominate other groups. For example, they number uh, prominently as recruited athletes or alumni children, or there have been quotas or large numbers of white students accepted at these uh, schools based on having a famous father, a rich father who has donated or pledged to donate large sums of money to that school, those kinds of things. Okay, uh, even some famous politicians, you know, have graduated from famous schools, but it doesn't mean that they were entitled to 
be accepted as great students in the first place. Some notable recent politicians may be mentioned who's, who got in, for example, to Yale as a result of being kind of legacy students. Legacy meaning having ancestors who have already studied there and perhaps contributed a lot of money as well. Now, um, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing quite well my slides are small print, but this is a uh, demographic of another important and highly debated thing, which is a typical famous American University's faculty demographic makeup. Uh, what you cannot easily see is that at Harvard in recent years, uh, women and minorities have constituted slightly under 50% of all, of all academic uh, positions. So it's been still a predominantly white and male institution, even if the numbers of women and minority professors have been rising. Uh, I have one more area which is of much interest and that is again the U uh, university system of California. As I've said, in California affirmative action as a government policy was banned by statewide referendum in 1996, but it doesn't mean that California schools have grown completely racist and segregated ever since. No. Uh, what has happened in California uh, that most, the most numerous student, uh, student uh, group has been the Asians who have uh, took over from whites, who are number two most numerous group. Number three has, have been the Hispanics and only number four have been the, the African-Americans. So higher education schools uh, in California have become, after the ban on affirmative action, predominantly uh, uh, filled with Asian-American students. For obvious reasons, they have been overachievers on tests and things like that. However, Many critics of affirmative action, I'm, I'm not really a fan of that, but many people say, hey, for example, if California has been predominantly Asian American, why not have a corresponding number of Asian American faculty at California schools? This, however, has not quite caught up. As you see, UC of Berkeley, uh, I have another figure on the group of figures on the right, which deals with the demographic uh, makeup of Berkeley faculty. So it's been predominantly white, over 60%. Second group, uh, Asians, over 24%. And just the number three has been the African-American professors at Berkeley, numbering about 10%. So this is what's been happening, that there has prob been really a big difference between the diversification of uh, the student demographics at U.S. Uh, schools and the relative conservative demographic of, of uh, U.S. academics or faculty professors who teach these people. But of course, arguably, uh, it's not always or completely necessary to have, for example, a professor of African-American studies to be only African-American. There have been Jewish-American professors of African-American studies of great repute. Yeti, uh, I, I think uh, we have come to uh, similar conclusions in a sense, and mm -hmm. maybe uh, we should uh, allow uh, the audience to ask questions. Uh, yeah. so, if so I have just two, two, sorry, I had to skip over many tables. And I just have two uh, finalizing remarks uh, from two scholars who have written and published recently. One is Melvin Urofsky, who in his book, The Aff Affirmative Action Puzzle, repeatedly claims that only, quote, a bigot could oppose a soft affirmative action policy that reaches out to different groups. Uh, 
Much of the uh, uproar about uh, this policy has come because of hard programs involving quotas and goals. And the other final quote by Louis Menand, who wrote an article on Urovsky's book and other issues is, quote, diversity, however we define it, is politically constructed and politically maintained. It doesn't just happen. It's a choice we make as a society, unquote. So I'll leave it at that. And if there are any questions, please. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you so much to, to both of you for uh, giving us those perspectives, the British perspective and the American perspective and, uh, um, and, and arriving at uh, or similar conclusions, as you just uh, said, Flavina. And, um, uh, and also, I think, uh, giving grounds on, on, on discussing this, uh, this firma. I mean, I want to just go back to um, uh, Flavina's uh, talk and um, make a few comments um, partly because I can really, really relate to it. I was educated at uh, the University of Sheffield as a red brick university. I was part of the faculty at the University of Nottingham, which you showed in one of your slides, the Jubilee campus, um, which in, in its heart is, in its character, is a red brick university, although it doesn't have the beautiful Victorian uh, buildings. Um, and, uh, uh, and also Nottingham very much defined itself as a um, kind of a wannabe ancient university. Um, which brings me, uh, and I think which is, really stands out here is that the you know, whole university system is so full of symbolic capital, prestige and distinction. And, um, and I think it, 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 it's really striking that in a, a society, the British society, which you can describe as being a diverse society and a highly divided, economically highly divided society, um, still there is a white middle-class system prevailing. So this is, I think, it's, it's a real clash that you have this, this ancient system, you know, always going back, deriving the symbolic capital from Oxford, Cambridge, blah, 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 um, and a, a, a society which has gone a completely different way. And uh, I mean, that, that, that brings high tension. Um, Sheffield was known for um, the town and gown uh, <laughs> diversity or, or clash more uh, and um, and I think that that's really uh, worth considering also um, uh, a note on economic situations going to university is um, <laughs> is, is, is an expensive matter uh, in, in in England and uh, not, not so much in Scotland I think uh, well if you're Scottish um, but but certainly in England and uh, and I think that kind of explains quite a few things uh, to just one comment um, I don't think it's just a cultural habit that people from minorities uh, stay at home while they go to university it's also an economic factor you know if you because it's really it's really expensive and then uh, and it's cheaper to stay at home uh, and therefore also apply to university which are close by and, and not go to the ones where you might want to go so i think um that's the uh, uh, that's a whole fascinating uh, <laughs> you know, uh, 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 cosmos you you opened up there for us and i think this um the symbolic capital of education in those and, and the institutions and uh, um is just a factor which is really, really highly dominant and uh, needs to be considered. Um, I also went to uh, the University of Indiana, but in, Dirk knows much more about the American system. Indiana is, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, IU is a very white, uh, again, a very middle class uh, university in, in, the, uh, in the middle of the, the US. Um, so it doesn't have the, uh, uh, the, the specifics that um, Jerry just uh, talked about, about Harvard and, uh, and the other Ivy League universities. Of, although it's as a state university, I think it's not too bad, um, but it, it's not as distinct distinct uh, and it also it doesn't feature as much in the uh, uh, in the, the discourse on uh, um, uh, diversity in higher education so maybe Dirk has a few things to say about the American perspective now I was you know I mean f first thank you really very much for these these two presentations I, I, it has shown us that it's very important to to have a look a closer look at the British and American university system of course if we talk about all these issues here of diversity and that has also become clear I think over the last uh, over the last um, uh, sessions here um, I mean it's there there are always somehow reference systems and even only if it comes to uh, 
if it comes to the theoretical backgrounds we are talking about, right? I mean, you mentioned Stuart Hall, and I mean all this post-colonial theory. Yeah, I mean it, it's it, it's a uh, it's um, it's a history between the Caribbean and 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 India and former colonies and um, and um, universities in the um, uh, in Britain or the U.S. mostly, right, or in France. And uh, and also therefore it's 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 really important to bring this perspective in here. Um, I was just wondering because you talked so much about, um, um, of course, I mean uh, gender issues and uh, and questions of of race. Um, so uh, when we had uh, Sabine Engel here last uh, last week. Um, um, she uh, she stressed the point that we, for example, here in Innsbruck, uh, in our uh, strategy now have chosen this focus on social status, or you, you could also say class, of course. Um, uh, especially if you go to to the US, but I mean, I think you could also discuss that when it comes to the UK. Um, so there's this enormous focus on these questions of uh, of uh, um, um, ethnic diversity at uh, the universities, but at the same time, of course, as Silke already said, uh, I mean, we know it's mostly um, a question of uh, social status, if you can uh, enter one of those um, universities, and especially in the US, right? I mean, it's enormously expensive to go to one of those um, universities, and it and it really defines um, the rest of the lives of the students, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because of you know uh, what it means in 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 terms of uh, of money and how long they have to pay pay it back, you know, for for the next decades uh, when they have a good job. So, um, can you maybe say a little bit about that? This, um, especially when it comes to U.S. universities. Uh, so, so we have this strong focus on ethnic diversity, of mm -hmm. course, questions of race, but uh, but but one of the most defining um, aspects, especially of the U.S. system, I guess, is uh, still the question of uh, social status and if you mm -hmm. can afford it. Uh, to go to one of those universities, right? Well, uh, if that's a question, of course, uh, many of the famous and prestigious U.S. universities uh, accept many uh, rich students because the high uh, cost of the education, tuition and everything is not an issue. It's the social prestige, you know, that goes along with attending one of these schools is all that matters. And I touched on that problem or that unofficial policy of famous U.S. universities, sometimes privileging students who come from famous and rich families because, you know, future donations might or even past donations might be happening to boost a less than stellar student's application in that way. So social status is a big thing in uh, many, especially the Ivy League and other famous research private universities in the US. But of course, the financial costs is another thing which is a big deal. I haven't mentioned this, but you know, I, I have taught in my uh, culture studies class a very strange video in which several recent US uh, university graduates speak about the costs of you know student debt after they have graduated and not a single one of these would say that having a very expensive uh, system of uh, university education in the US is a bad idea no even if all of them were badly in debt after graduating they all thought that, you know, university education should be expensive and like setting up a free university education, which one of the few countries such as the Czech Republic have had, they all expressed the opinion that free uh, university education would be a disastrous idea. So it's very contradictory, but that's, I think, uh, 
the way Americans have viewed things which are free. If something is for free, it must be of terrible quality, yeah? including university education. So on the one hand, as you say, there have been many uh, recent graduates or even people who drop out of school without finishing it being badly in debt. On the other hand, they consider it normal because it should be expensive to get a good degree in the US. If I may add uh, to this discussion the, the British perspective, uh, to use the business uh, terminology, um, most of the students um, in the same way as uh, the Americans that usually mentioned uh, featuring being featured in the video, uh, think that uh, although uh, education might be very expensive, it's a good investment. Mm -hmm. And as Silke said, uh, in Britain we still see a society that is class written. And there is a widening gap between uh, the individual classes of the society, of course. But uh, geographically uh, speaking, we also see different approaches. Like you mentioned Scotland. If you are Scottish, you have free education at Scottish universities, whereas the English, that is people coming from England or Ireland, um, they have to pay. So it's the local government that takes care of that. Uh, I mean, the government in Scotland that promotes uh, university uh, education in, in that way. And when I mentioned, of course, it's very sketchy, uh, the uh, cultural background of the UK students in their uh, decision making which university they would attend, uh, it is closely connected to the value system of the cultural or ethnic groups, if you wish, because uh, whereas the Asians, in particular the Chinese, are willing to um, uh, to victimize uh, the rest of the family in in financial terms uh, uh, that means they would all contribute towards the cost uh, of the education for uh, the members of the family you know because they see that if they graduate from a prestigious university that in all probability it would open the gates to good jobs whereas the black uh, people in Britain don't have education uh, in the system of values so high as the Chinese have it. And that's why they rather prefer to stay at home. And um, the, uh, the Asians, unlike the black, uh, the communities are larger at uh, university. So they feel somewhat safer at the campuses they uh, uh, click together, they, uh, they like to, to be together as a community. There are Chinese clubs and so on, so uh, it's a difference in attitude, I would mm -hmm. say. I mean, it's. Um, but, <laughs> I think it's really important uh, to um, uh, to to uh, underline what you just said that uh, in, in the British system and also in the American system, education can also be regarded as a commodity. It's an investment, right. and it it sells. And I mean, it's so interesting that we, here we talk about who is admitted and uh, the, the the percentage of Asian, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Nottingham had a um, a Malaysia and a Singapore campus. So it's not about uh, getting people here to pay. I mean, they offer the British, you know, the British good, the British commodity uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in those places. Um, we have the opportunity to go and work um, over summer, teach over summer. It was highly paid um, and you would get sort of the Nottingham degree and as, as the investment, um, but you didn't have to move to the UK. So I mean, these satellite campuses is that that that's uh, um, it's also I mean, it's an idea. Um, it's a big selling idea, um, and it kind of um, undermines that what we what we talk about about diversity and who is admitted because the universities itself uh, start selling abroad, and I think that that's that's very interesting as well. I mean, yeah. Uh, 
it's not only abroad, but if you take the example of the University of Newcastle, just on the Scottish border, right, very close to the English border, they don't have the satellite campuses abroad, but they have set up a campus in London because uh, they want to reach a different audience. So we have the satellite campuses abroad, like many of them in Asia, our university has set up one uh, as well, but it's interesting to see that within the domestic market, you know, they try to reach uh, the metropolis as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. Can you, Pavlina, maybe share a few thoughts on the the UK system after Brexit, how that affects the the whole scenery? I mean, it's, uh, of course, it was an, I guess it was a huge change, you know, um, when the UK entered the EU, because uh, it made it much easier uh, for European citizens to go to study there. But now the reverse, um, mm -hmm. the reverse case uh, also coming with all these uh, fantasies of good old, uh, I don't know, British mm -hmm. world domination um, and so on. Um, can you tell us a little bit in your, your view how that, how the Brexit changes? changes the, the British uh, university system? Uh, massively, I would say. <laughs> um, my background is in English uh, studies, and that's why uh, it makes our situation really difficult for international cooperation because the financial schemes have changed tremendously. There were two factors influencing uh, the current situation. One, it's COVID, of course, and second, it's Brexit. And the third factor that I would mention are the financial funds available. Whereas in the US uh, context, we have um, uh, all these schemes for scholarships and supports. And if you study within your home state, uh, the state universities are free of charge. Um, in Britain, it's much more difficult to get a scholarship at the prestigious university. And uh, knowing it from the experience of some of my students uh, who decided to go and study on the MA level in the UK before Brexit, even before Brexit, they said, you must survive, and they used this word, survive the first year financially. And only then you can ask based on your performance uh, for various scholarships. So, and for example, Oxford and Com Cambridge, they ask you to prove that you have sufficient uh, financial background uh, that enables you to study at the university. And these uh, financial funds uh, must cover not only the tuition, but also the sustenance, uh, that is the living costs, uh, etc. And they check it to that extent that it must stay uh, on your bank account for a substantial period of time. So um, after Brexit, some of the scholarships are not available to uh, EU or uh, in general overseas uh, students. And uh, the tuition fees are, of course, much, much higher because we are now in a different uh, category. So I think, um, of course, it is uh, too short a period uh, to have uh, hardcore data, but there is going to be a drop of international uh, presence, international students uh, at uh, British universities, simply because they will not be able to um, uh, to afford it, unless they have a financial backing from their home countries. And uh, in terms of research cooperation, and we can see it uh, within uh, the Erasmus, uh, since they are not part of the partner countries group anymore, it's uh, difficult to continue not only to set up new, but to continue the current uh, relationships and exchanges that, that we have, because there is no EU funding for it. Mm. So, whereas EU scholars have still some funds available, British scholars are left alone, so to say, 
and they didn't know um, uh, because new schemes haven't been set up uh, on the on the British uh, side. Uh, they don't know how to continue and are very hesitant to enter various projects. Not to say uh, or not to mention that uh, they cannot be included in EU projects as the core members anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think we are at the end of the time. Is that correct, Silke? Um, thank you so much, uh, Pavlina and Yezhi, for your two presentations, uh, bringing the US and the UK situation to us. I think that was very important. Um, we have one more meeting to come next week. Mm -hmm. And finally, uh, going to the northern part of our Aurora network to uh, the University of Iceland um, with Brynja Halsdors Dottir Gudjonsson and uh, Karin Ruud Gisla Dottir um, and they will talk next week uh, about leading equity initiatives in Icelandic higher education a view from the University of Iceland. Um, do you have a final word Silke? <laughs> Two, two words. Um, be, because Brexit makes things so difficult, that's why we need Aurora and other schemes. I think that okay. that can hold up. And uh, perhaps as a summary, I just want to draw attention again to that last quote, which you can still, still see on the slide. I think that's very fitting yes. for the entire course. Mm -hmm. Diversity uh, it's a, is a choice we make as society. Thank you very much to both of you for your presentations. Uh, see you soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.